So it's growing on a daily basis. This data wouldn't be up to date, so it wouldn't have the, the information that Niall's been, you, you know, you've been working on up in, up in the north and maybe some of the sites in the Boyne. But it's a growing, growing database of wrecks. And as Niall was saying yesterday, you can see the concentrations <coughs> really in the kind of northern half of the country where most of the, 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 the lakes occur and, and the big rivers. Um, and you can see there's different concentrations on different important arteries and waterways and uh, in here in Loch Carb in particular, which I'm going to talk about. But I think, Michael, you asked the question yesterday, why are there no log boats in the River Tagus or other lakes in Portugal? Um, and, I, and I think it's a matter of going searching for them, going out to find them. If you search for them, you will find them because they're there, they were being used. And I think Loch Carb is an example of that. Um, Let's say 15 years ago, we had five log boats known from this waterway. Now we have about 50. And that's because somebody went out and started looking for them. So if you go, if you go and, and look for them, you'll, you'll definitely find them. So this is Loch Carb in the west of Ireland, just above Galway City. It's quite a long lake. It's about 47 kilometers long. It's a, the biggest lake in the Republic, but the second biggest lake in Ireland. About 17 kilometers here uh, wide uh, at the top. And it narrows to about 600 meters here in the, in the middle. And that's where most of our work has been carried out. Um, and that's where most of the survey work has been carried out that has identified these sites. So just a little bit of context. Uh, La Carbe doesn't have any major known prehistoric sites. It has a few like megalithic tombs and burials and from various periods. But it's not a well-known kind of prehistoric center as, as maybe like Bruna Boina and the World Heritage Site at Newgrange would be known. But it is marked on. Uh, Ptolemy's uh, list of sites. This is a 15th century representation of Ireland. And we can see that this is the river Carib here that, that, that uh, feeds, um, that uh, uh, Loch Carib drains from, and it's known as the River Asoba. And it also mentions a tribe here called the Atini or the Otani in, in Irish. And it's unclear if this tribe were a bit further south in Loch Carib or um, in this area. But it's exciting to think that we have a name of a tribe who some of these early Iron Age boats are associated with. So this map, a lot of detail was gathered back into uh, you know, the early centuries uh, uh, BC. So we are going back into the Iron Age and potentially some of this information stems from uh, even the late Bronze Age. The lake, it's a beautiful lake. If you ever get to go, it's, it's, it's very nice, especially on a, a fine summer's day like this. This is last week. We spent two weeks out in the lake, uh, 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 um, just got back on Sunday doing some um, exciting work, and it is a very beautiful site. Lots of angling and lots of historical sites around it. But the lake has its hidden dangers. It's quite a shallow lake, um, and this is during a drought period. You can see all these rocks here. Normally, these would be covered in water, so unless you know where you're going, you're going to easily uh, run aground. We've run aground a few times, bust a prop on your boat, so you have to be very careful. And up until recently, this chart was the only chart of the lake. It was, it was done in the 1840s, so it wasn't very accurate. It was, it was useful, but not totally accurate. So this chap here, Trevor Nortage, he's an angler. He bust, bust his prop on out angling and got frustrated. He's a master mariner. He, he kind of manages a fleet of ships in Brazil, but he, he comes and kind of you know, stays in Ireland quite a bit. So he decided to go and map the lake himself. And one of the byproducts of him mapping the lake, he's an amateur surveyor. He mapped the lake, but in great detail and did a really great job was that he started coming up with these side scan sonar images here. This is a recreational side scan. It's about a thousand euro. It's used by fishermen to find fish, which is kind of cheating, I think, but uh, it can be very useful for the archeologists. So you can scan the lake bed and you can come up with images like this. This is a 10 meter long uh, clinker vessel. It's an early, probably 20th century kind of pleasure boat. Um, kind of, you can see it's quite slick, so it would have been kind of maybe used for, for, for racing or, um, or so on. So when he found this, we went and dived it, and then uh, we said, look, maybe go through all your old data, and he started to go through that data, and um, he sent us a picture of one log boat, and we said, yeah, that's a, that's a log boat. Check for more of these now. And eventually, a long story short, he's found, he found about 150, 200 anomalies. We've dived most of them, um, but certainly possibly up to 50 of them are um, log boats. So before he started mapping this lake, we had five log boats here, we had one here, one there, and one in here. Um, and he has now discovered these 50 log boats, which is fair play. He's an amateur I suppose, surveyor who's gone out and had the passion for that. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of like build it and, and they will come or, or, or go and, and, and search and you will find. Um, 
So why are we then diving these log boats when we have 18,000 shipwrecks around our coast and, and hundreds of other sites in the inland waterways, let alone all the monuments like bridges and stuff like that, is that when we started to find the log boats, we found some interesting artifacts and, and well-preserved boats. So we quickly realized that there's a number of threats to these sites, which include invasive weed clearance work. So there's this um, invasive species called, I think it's a South African uh, curly weed pond um, that colonizes large areas of the, of the lake. It sucks all the oxygen out of the lake and the fish die. So the fisheries people go in and clear the weed out. And whilst that's good for the fish, it can be detrimental for the archeology span if these kind of little diggers here are going in impacting sites. Um, anchoring activities, even from small fishing boats or from navigation works uh, can impact a wreck, a log boat. So you can see here, if you can understand, it's a drag line here, this is a sonar image. There is a wreck here, it's hard to see. The navigation people dragged an anchor which was on the sea bed, on the lake bed, and it missed this boat by about three meters. So it was a close call. Um, so we tried to prevent, we work with the, with the navigation people to try and prevent that. Um, storm damage, obviously, increased storm risk can impact sites. And then we have these little zebra mussels here, another invasive species, that cling to hard surfaces in the lake bed, and they like log boats. And it can be very useful for finding log boats because they, they stand out very well in the sonar. But the life cycle of these is that they, they send in their little suckers cling to the wood, and then when they die, they fall off and maybe slowly delaminate the, the boats, which could remove all the important kind of tool marks and features that, that um, might survive. And then obviously, there was a bit of a strong uh, tradition in the area of diving uh, without a license or interfering, looting and stuff like that. So we wanted to protect these important sites from, from that type of activity. So this is the main area of work here. Um, this is the, sh the shortest area, uh, Knock Ferry here and uh, Kilbeg. We know this is a, a, a pairing point from probably the 18th, 19th century backwards, but most of these boats here are Bronze Age and Iron Age. So we kind of gathered that this was an important ferrying point from that period onwards. And if you control this ferry, probably going from one side to the other, and there's two territorial boundaries, uh, you know, two different tribes on either side, you can control the water traffic north and south but also the ferrying of people across here. And so surprised with such concentration here of, of, um, of, of, of these prehistoric boats. And it just so happens that I only got a load of dates back this week, but most of these boats here are medieval. So it looks like the ferrying point, or the, the point of activity, moved from here in prehistoric times to here for whatever, for whatever reason. There is a couple of important sites. There's an important stone fort here, a castle here, a later house here. So it seems to sh the shift of power moved from possibly here, or maybe this island, to this, this area here. So we can, we've employed different techniques to try and map these as well. We use multi-beam. This is a scan of a log boat here. It's a, it's a, a nine meter long, uh, late Bronze Age boat. And you can just see the outline of it there. You can see it, there's a stone in the, in the bow there. So those cheap recreational sonars can identify these sites quite easily. Um, so I'm going to give you a world world tour of some of the sites we've, we've, we've dealt with over the years because I just don't have time and I could speak about it all day and I'm going to go in kind of in chrono chronological order just to, for sake of ease. So, I know, so we dive, that slide's out of sequence there, but we are a dive unit. We also contract in divers to support us on our activities and we, we use um, mostly scuba or surface supply diving so to go in and, and carry out our investigation. So when we go in a log boat, we carry out a quick assessment um, and decide whether we carry the full excavation or a rapid just uh, assessment. And one thing I'll just say, from the beginning, we're not lifting these boats at the moment. The plan was in the beginning that when we had 10 of these log boats, we do an assessment and we might decide what log boats we lift because we heard yesterday the conservation issues surrounding lifting log boats are quite, quite large and, uh, you know, and it takes a lot of resources. But Trevor kept on finding more and more sites, so now we're 50. So we said we'd assess them all and then decide, uh, uh, put in place a management plan. So we, we, we got, this is the earliest boat we have. It's about 3,500 BC. It's eight meters long. It's hard to see it possibly here because it, it kind of, it's the same color as this delay sediment here. But um, it's an it's a, it's a eight meter long log boat. It's broken at the bow. Um, and it's a whole series of cracks along it um, here. And it's sitting on a little mound, so it's kind of cracked downwards. Um, and the upper side walls of the boat are gone. They're eroded away. It's very fragile. You could almost snap it like a, like a biscuit. 
Um, and we see there's staining from, from um, the tree sap or in the wood. But uh, it's quite a featureless boat, but um, the interesting thing about it is that, apart from its date of 3,500, is that it's made from pine. And we don't have um, many pine boats in Ireland, we just have, have two. So, we can see it here, this is um, uh, well, it's like once, once you clear the silt off, you can um, clear the silt quite easily, it just wafts off. So, these sites are very vulnerable. Or impact them, so you can see these cracks. So it is, it is deteriorating over time. Um, so I'll, I'll move on because you can kind of get the gist of it there. But um, you can see actually a complete break there. So, so moving on a bit, we have um, this is actually the first boat we dived, and it's a 12 and a half meter long uh, oak log boat. Um, this is a, a plan of it. From above, uh, you can see it here. And whilst the upper walls are gone, again, what's preserved in the boat, or what's in what was covered in silt, is preserved very well. And we see this well-preserved longitudinal ridge with these cross ridges here. You can see there's you know one, remains of one here, two, three, four, and a bit of one here. Um, and I suppose the question is, what what is this ridge for? Um, is it demarking space for crew or for cargo? Is it demarking space for, based on social status? Or is it a case that it's um, um, trying to mimic maybe a plank boat or a, a skin boat that had some sort of features like this? I'm not convinced by the plank boat um, um, theory because I'm not sure we have plank boats like this at the time. So um, maybe it just had some, some symbolic uh, uh, function that we don't know about. Interesting, there's a patch of burning here. So somebody lit a fire in the boat here and here. Um, and maybe, maybe that's key to the, to the answer to the boat. Um, let's see a bit, bit more detail there. Finely worked, fin finished surface there. Um, and this is around 2400 BC, so we're getting the introduction of copper, copper axis at the time. And they obviously feel they can, they can challenge these big trees um, 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 and, and, f and finally work them. But the other interesting thing about this boat is that it's almost an exact replica of the Lurgan boat, which is on display in the National Museum in Dublin, and this is uh, 15 metres 30 long. Um, you can see it here, it was found in 1902, and um, this is only 20 kilometres away from the Anakin boat, and they have the exact same design on them. They both have these longitudinal ridges and, um, and uh, cross ridges. This is the Lurgan boat here, this is the boat from Loch Carib. Uh, another boat, again found in a similar location, here, which isn't, doesn't survive so well, and apologies for the drawing, but it uh, has these longitudinal ridges here. But the interesting thing is all these boats are in one geographical location, and they're basically all the same date. So somebody in the northeast of Loch Harb has decided they want their boats built to this design. It's a preconceived pre design for whatever reason. Um, you know, there's the theory that this boat is a ritual deposition in a bog, um, I know Niall's spoken about it and said it probably wouldn't have floated very well. Uh, it is a very heavy boat, yeah. And um, so maybe it was a ceremony boat that was just used, it was deposited in a bog. And the bog is adjacent to a river that feeds into Loch Carb. Again, we're wondering, was this a ceremonial boat as well? This burning could be an indication of some ceremony out in the lake where they burned some herbs or something like that. Not sure about this one, I don't, I don't know too much about it, but... Um, Again, yeah, so what, what are these boats used for? It's a huge boat, 12 and a half metres long or so. Um, it's not a boat there you go out probably for everyday fishing. It has to be manned by a certain amount of people. Uh, it could have been a high status boat for a local chief or something like that. Uh, maybe a ceremonial boat. Um, you can imagine a band of warriors on it as well. Um, so who knows? Um, again, we're also finding lots of boats with stone in them. Um, Almost every boat has a stone, but it's like this one here, which I showed you, a side scan sonar image in, in, in an early slide here. This is the boat here, a couple of ridges and a stone. Um, other boats with stones. Working towards a the theory that maybe these stones um, could be primitive anchors, because we found one uh, with a, a kind of a witty rope just adjacent to it, and maybe it's part of an anchoring system just to hold it if it wanted to, to, to stay in place for whatever reason. 
And then we have these boats here with three boats. Um, these are all Bronze Age boats, mid to late Bronze Age boats here. And um, this is a 10 meter long boat here uh, with a cargo of limestone blocks, more limestone blocks here. Um, and you're kind of wondering why they're carrying these cargoes of limestone blocks, because limestone is everywhere in the lake. Every shoreline is covered in limestone, the fields, the field walls. Um, so don't have time to go into too much, but I suppose the working theory is that these boats had come to the, to, to, to the end of their useful life and that they were purposely sunk. They're all in six metres of water, all within a couple of hundred metres of each other, similar date period, and that they were purposely sunk, kind of a ritual killing or symbolic killing of the boats and deposit on the bed that we get all over Europe with other boats. Um, so, um, yeah, there's another, another couple of boats with this type of stone in it, so who knows? Um, I spoke at Akua last year about this, and um, I have an article coming out shortly, so there's a bit more detail in it than that. So, yeah, this is just a close up here. You see these stones here sitting on moss. Um, these boats have cracks in them. So, I'm just wondering is it um, a case of could those cracks have, have occurred underwater? Like oak will, will split quite easily on when, it's, when it dries out. So, had the boat cracked and maybe kind of become useless, so they decided to offer it to the lake deity or some god and um, um, bury it underwater. So, um, so, just moving on a little bit, a few, a few uh, hundred years into the early Iron Age, this is um, early Iron Age time, so we have this um, seven and a half metre long boat. I only got it wood ID this week. I always thought it was oak or a funny type of oak, but it actually turns out it's ash, which is quite unique. I think it's the first ash log boat in Ireland, isn't it, Niall? Yeah, yeah. And I know, Bob, you, you, you've done some work in, in England, and I just think there's one, one log boat from, from England made of ash. So it's quite unique. And it was always funny looking, because there's a huge amount of sap wood on it. The upper layer of the boat, you can see all this yellowy wood here is, is uh, sap wood. And then we have this darker heartwood, which is kind of almost black. Seven and a half meters long, 70 centimeters wide, two seats, a long steering oar, um, a spear, an iron spearhead under one seat, um, this long steering oar here. It's not a paddle, it's too big. It's two meters long, so it's like up here. So it's not meant for this log boat, it's meant for a different boat. You know, and I'd argue it's meant for like a, maybe a, a, a cork or something like that. But um, the seats are made from U, rounded. Um, and, but it, most interesting, I think, is that we have this hafted iron axe here, an early iron axe based on these late Bronze Age uh, style uh, socketed, looped and socketed axes. Um, and uh, yeah, so interesting. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But it had developed a split on its shine here on its um, uh, port side. And it's not surprising because that, that area there was sapwood. Um, but imagine it might have been something like this, two-person boat um, with a space in the middle for carrying a cargo, and it's located at this ferrying point, so it could have been ferrying people across uh, from one side to the other. These are the finds here, this uh, beautifully carved uh, uh, steering oar, and you know, it does remind me of the steering oar from this gold model boat, which dates to the same period here. It has the same almost proportions, almost, but I know this is just a model, but you know, it's the only indication of, of, a, of a steering oar we have from, from Iron Age Ireland. Um, so this is uh, probably the most interesting aspect of the boat, is that we have this hafted iron axe. And it's been integrated into the boat. So they have um, uh, made this axe part of the boat, um, and I'll discuss that in a minute why. But they did this by, this is a seat, you see this gap here. They've lowered the seat down to clamp the axe into place. And in order to do this, they've carved a semicircular notch so the seat sat into it. And this, the, basically the axe become locked into the boat. They carved a little recess in the side wall so the head of the, 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 the axe handle here also rested into it. So this axe basically became redundant. It wouldn't work as a functioning axe because the handles, you know, the integrity of the handle has been uh, damaged. And it's not something you could easily take out. You know, it's locked in place here. So, um, so you have to ask the question, why did they incorporate the axe into the boat? What was the purpose of that? 
And I suppose what we have come up with is that as part of um, the intention was that it was a part of a ritual deposition, that this whole boat had um, maybe come to the end of its useful life and decided to de deposit the boat on the lake bed as a votive offering. Um, do I have another side now? No, yeah, here, you can see it here. So this boat also has two thickness gauge holes in it, and one of them had been removed. And when they lowered the seat, it also would let water into the side. Um, so basically, the boat would no, no longer float because it was let in, let in it, the water from the sides and below, and was it a case that they deposited this boat on the lake bed um, as a votive offering? Possibly to the chief, maybe it was a boat burial, maybe it was a, 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 the, the master craftsman or the main log boat builder had died and that he was buried. Here's the axe here. Here's the thickness gauge hole without the, the plug. The other one's still in place. And we don't think that this, this rotted away because the preservation of the wood inside the boat, cut wood and everything was fantastic. Um, and there's another thickness gauge hole there. Um, so here we see this. And so was it a master craftsman who died possibly and they made a boat of offering in honor of him with a spear, his work axe, maybe the last object he made, the stirring oar, um, possibly like that, so I'm not sure. Um, there was, a, a, I'd say, a replica made in 2019. Now, it wasn't a very accurate replica. Um, it's a bit short, it's about two, two and a half meters short and about you know, 20 centimeters uh, too narrow, and probably not enough wood taken out of it. But um, it was great that the local community got involved in the log boats in the lake and uh, uh, saw the merits in it. And hundreds and hundreds of people turned up to see this launched. And it was a great sight to see a log boat floating on the lake again, and kind of trying to encourage the local community there to maybe you know, build on this and make more log boats, and maybe hold like the gratis you have, Cyril, um, on the lake because it is part of their, their heritage now and it is an important part of the, the wider heritage of, of the lake. Um, so yeah, this site might have been pretty common, would have been very common back in the Iron Age and Bronze Age. Um, now, I, I just put this in this morning because we spoke about thickness gauge holes uh, yesterday and this one has I think 17 of them here. And um, my explanation for that is that the wood grain of this is so poor, so distorted, that the tree is obviously twisted and turned as it was growing, um, and that they were afraid that there could be, um, uh, it might split, and this is a preventative measure. measure. So it's just, it's just a theory. It's the only log boat we have that's like this, with so many um, uh, um, thickness gauges, but also it's, um, it's the log boat with the worst wood grain on it. Most of the wood grain on most of the log boats is quite straight, and they make good choices. But, but for whatever reason, we can see um, um, they, they struggle to get um, the, the, the tree choice here was quite, quite poor, or maybe it's the only tree available to them at the time. So it's a theory um, open to discussion. Moving on, we, we've only recently started finding a, a number of these later in medieval log boats, like this small, 3.3 3 meter long, log boat. It, we did lift it temporarily just to record it uh, because we were so cold. We were, we were diving here in November, so cold out the, on the lake. And we can see that where the silt covered the boat, the tool marks are all preserved and the silt is almost like a, a preservation in its own right. And um, so we recorded. It's good to see the underside of a boat for us because we don't turn the boats over on the water. And you can see how smooth and well carved it is and how this boat would have, I suppose, uh, bedded in, in the water. Um, we stuck it in to see if we float. Not that much of it's left, but it, it floated there for about five minutes, which shows it was, it was well made and well designed. And that's, sorry, just say that, that that's a, a one person rowboat. You know, we've got the footrests there. Um, and again, we're finding in the medieval period we have these rowboats coming along. Again, here we have footrests here. This is a bit longer, it's five meters, not as well preserved, but um, we're moving forward here. Um, and again, we have another uh, one-person rowboat here. Um, well preserved, we can see there's a ledge here for holding a seat, and um, you have to see here that there's another block here which has a pin in it for its toll. So it's like a, an oar lock for rowing. Um, you can see the, the, the toll pin there, which uh, the oar would have sat into. Um, 
And interestingly, it, it seems to be a boat that stayed, the tradition of this boat stayed on the lake for a long time. And there is this traditional kind of um, watercraft here, which again is about the same length, has the same seat arrangement here, um, with the with the with the, with the, the or oarsmen there facing towards the stern, tow pin, and the oars are, are are quite similar as well. And I think it's great to see that this tradition of using these single uh, rowboats has survived from the early medieval period right up in, 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 into into modern times. And this is one just taken uh, a couple of years ago, um, still in use. So. Um, so this boat, when we found it, uh, we thought we had a ritual deposition. We have this on the sonar. We could see two bits of a log boat here. We dived it. We found these. We could never get good uh, imagery of it. It's just in a kind of dirty, silty part of the lake. We, we see. We could see it was chopped in two. And we said this is probably another destruction of a boat in prehistoric times. But we got the date back, and uh, it was 980 AD. So we're a bit surprised by that, but. I suppose we do have references in historic annals that um, we, people destroyed the boats of other tribes. So this is probably a case that this is a, maybe during war or a raid where they found a, a, an enemy's boat and, and, and chopped it in two so it could no longer be used. And I suppose think, speaking of these war canoes, we have this one here, 6.3 meter long, uh, oak log boat, very finely carved. Three of the five seats are still in place. There's a missing seat here. Um, and um, this is what it looks like, you see. When we first came across it, we were very surprised. We thought it, it almost looked like a, a modern rowboat, you know, and a lot of the boats on the lake are constructed in the same, si same style. They have these blocks for seats sitting in them. They're oar locks like this, and the only difference is they're made in fiberglass now rather than, um, than, um, than wood. Um, so it's a very finely carved boat. No thickness gauge holes in this, and you can see it's basically only a centimetre or two in places um, here, and I suppose it's a beautiful carved boat and would have been very manoeuvre on the lake, would have been quite fast, but this was, um, it's, it's, it's finely carved nature, I suppose, was part of its downfall in that it was carrying this large red sandstone block here, and just when we lifted this stone out, um, basically there was a big crack in the floor and we see the floor was only two centimetres thick, and it looked like it was actually sap wood at the time. So the, the boat was, the whole of the floor was just too light. They were taking this stone, probably as a gift, maybe to the local church or local uh, chieftain, and it cracked. We know these red sandstone's quite rare in the area, I mean, but they know on an island monastery that they did use it for these decorative features like this Celtic cross here. Um, also, lots of weapons on the boat, like this here. These Hibernian Norse battle axes, cherry wood handles um, and a throwing axe, two spears. So we can gather that there was probably uh, a band of warriors in this boat, maybe four or five warriors that um, were going, bringing the stones as a gift maybe to a local, another tribe or to one of the churches um, as part of maybe a patronage uh, activity. So uh, these boats are on, on display. Uh, or these axes are on display in the National Museum if you ever want to see them. And then this one always intrigued us because we weren't sure of its age. It has a bit of a prehistoric look to it, maybe late Bronze Age, um, but it shows you never can, can for sure date a boat by looking at it. Um, but it has these cross ridges here, um, a funny longitudinal ridge here, but a, a slot for a transom board, which is more of a feature of the late Bronze Age and, and Iron Age than, than any other period. And we can see sapwood here, so um, here. And most of the boats actually have sapwood on them. But we did find a 50. 50 p coin from 1970 in the boat. So we're wondering, maybe did somebody dive this? You know, we gathered they weren't making log boats in, in the 1970s. But um, it, um, it is the latest boat we found on the lake, dating to 1570 or so, when you have these castle sites. This, this is very close, maybe two or three kilometers away from this boat. And it'd be, you know, it's interesting to think that this boat could have been coming up this river here to service this castle um, over time. So. Looking forward, um, we have a couple of more years' of work to do on the lake, we have two more seasons potentially, and then we have to make a decision, what do, do we do with all these boats? Do we lift some? Do we conserve them? Do we preserve them in situ? We know the lake is very good preservative qualities, um, and um, I suppose a lot of people want them displayed locally, which would be good, um, and then other people want them kept 
in the underwater. They feel their natural place is underwater. So that's uh, a decision we'll have to make. And, um, and obviously, we are starting to get to the stage now we're going to start publishing all of this work. We have a, a good uh, publication plan in place to try and get all this data out over, over time. So um, I better leave it there because I think I'm probably out of time now. So, so thank you all. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Carl. That was wonderful. Um, we're going to take questions, I think, at the end because we have an extra paper. Um, but I sense there will be many, many questions and lots of people will want to talk to you later on as well. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Niall Gregory. Um, I first came across Niall um, when I saw a photograph of an, some Irish guy who'd built a replica log boat um, on a Heritage Council document and I had to, I had to find this guy, um, which was well over 30 years ago, I think. So um, he was doing his thesis on the log boats of Scotland and Ireland at the time. Um, he's been very generous with his time, and um, as well as running a very busy commercial uh, archaeological firm, he gives his time to uh, a lot of community initiatives, and he's um, the advisor to a few groups, um, and last year for his sins I dragged him in to give a tutorial for the Nautical Archaeology Society, where he had to bring a two or three ton log boat, 600 miles round trip, um, to give the chance for some young budding archaeologist mm -hmm. to get the chance to record a log boat. So um, Niall's going to um, talk about, it's a thing he, want, he's, he wants to progress, is to standardise across Europe the way log boats are recorded, so then you can compare and contrast. So, Niall. Thanks, Serena. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation, Carl. Thank you for that. So it's a great way to start off the morning. Um, so some of what we're, uh, I'll be addressing was actually uh, came into discussion sort of sessions and some of the, uh, the papers that were given yesterday. So um, I, I know we have an extra sort of speaker on this morning sort of session, so I'll try to you know speed up myself up and uh, see where we go here. Yeah, so i um, going to start off with some of the aspects of the uh, challenges of, um, of recording uh, dugout boats, and this feeds into the process of the interpretation of them as well. So um, obviously one of the very first ones is the environment in which uh, we find these boats. Um, I saw the, the photographs there, the fantastic ones from Carl there, and um, they showed sort of beautiful and almost sort of clear waters in the bottom of Loch Carrib. So, you know, sort of even belying sort of some of the challenges we actually have in terms of even in shallow water with lakes there can be sediment sort of build up as well. But I suppose it became a little bit heartened that he sort of had made a, uh, a, a case for me there where just one or two slides showed a little bit of sort of a, uh, poor sort of visibility. But uh, it is a, a dynamic environment. Um, you know, we, we come across all sorts of challenges. Uh, so I think that even in shallow sort of waters that the boats are more accessible to, uh, to recording, they're not, you know, they can be actually sort of very sort of hostile in terms of uh, in fast flowing sort of currents and so on. So this is one of the actual uh, hurdles that we have to, you know, overcome in being able to access them. Um, the other part is their survivability. So uh, again, great to see uh, Carl's photographs that some of them were um, uh, very much intact. But quite often, we have a situation that the vast majority of the boats, if we're lucky, is just the floor of the boat survives. And this gives us uh, problems in terms of interpretation. Where um, the vast majority of us here are uh, maritime or boat archaeologists. So we know what to recognize, we know what to record. But we're quite often dependent on the broader archaeological profession that aren't necessarily cognizant in um, what uh, early watercraft can look like, especially if it's um, you know skin or plank built and it's deconstruction, disassembled, uh, you know through erosion, wear and tear. But sometimes you might only have something like um, this photograph here, which is the bow of a dugout boat that was pulled up during flood waters, um, you know from uh, from a river there. So it's a question of survivability can often be you know a sort of big challenge. Uh, then there's um, the issue about training, as I mentioned there. Um, the vast majority of the archaeological profession 
you know, they, 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 they haven't been trained in, in watercraft. And if you think that a lot of dugout boats, they're found in freshwater environments, so they can't, they're often seen as, um, as a separate sort of entity to what's going on in the broader environment around them. So you have to look at what's actually sort of happening, historical records, archaeological sort of sites, and have a more holistic or integrated you know, uh, you know, approach in that regard, and we can bring process into um, the broader archaeological profession. Uh, quite often in the Republic of Ireland, uh, we have tradition of burnt mounds, um, which are cooking or sweat lodge sites, and we have troughs hollowed out from tree trunks to hold water in place as part of the function of them. And quite often, these are seen as being dugout boats. I've yet to come across any uh, evidence for any um, dugout boat being used in, uh, in one of these burnt mound sort of sites. But it seems to have translated into the archaeological, national and international lore that any burnt site in Ireland must have a, have a, a reused dugout boat. But that's you know, further from the truth. In Nor Northern Ireland, there's a tendency for the shoots for horizontal green mills to be uh, misinterpreted. So when we have these misinterpretations, you know, it gives a very poor understanding, you know, in terms of what uh, the, um, the, the boats are about. Um, then one of the other ones aspects is that you've got a huge range in, uh, in the size. Um, we have some of them as short of, as um, 2.8 metres in length, and some of them going as large as 15.3 uh, metres, like the Lurgan boat that uh, Carl also talked about in the bottom photograph there. Uh, so when we have this sort of huge uh, variety in sort of shapes and sizes, again, it, it becomes a challenge in terms of how do we interpret them, how do we classify them, how do we create sort of typologies, you know, and so on. And it's also, you see huge variety in, in hull design as well, because with uh, your standard plank uh, boat, if you like, uh, we, we have the, the keel and the ribs that create the frame of the boat, and then the skin is the planking coming around that gives its water tightness and gives its functionality in terms of uh, naval architecture. Uh, whereas with dugout boats, the skin and the frame are one and the same. So there's so much more fluidly sort of sculpted, if you like. So that gives a much greater uh, variety in hull shape and design. Uh, then we look at the uh, actual number of discoveries. Uh, I mentioned yesterday there are approximately 500 boats uh, recorded um, in Ireland. So it looks like you know, Ireland's got a case of measles there. Um, also the same with, with Denmark as well. So we can have just that huge number becomes almost like how do we uh, quantify them? How do we qualify them? How do we you know, create sort of typologies you know, for them within the parameters of these changes in size and variety? I would say this uh, particular slide is uh, uh, com uh, compiled by uh, Lars Kruger in Germany and is presented by uh, Merin in uh, one of the early European Association um, uh, presentations during, uh, I think it was during COVID, so uh, it's very great for the online being able to use some screen grabs and being able to use uh, this with his permission, of course. Uh, then, of course, is the quality of the records. If people don't know what they're looking at, they don't know what to record and how to uh, you know, re record it. Uh, so a lot of details can be overlooked. And when we overlook the details, you know, we're not being able to fully and properly interpret you know, these sort of crafts. So it's very important. Uh, and finally, in terms of the challenges, it's the accessibility you know, of records is very important. That these are made available, if you like, to the um, wider sort of boat sort of community as well, so that we can discuss, we can compare environments and uh, performances such as this, um, so we can actually understand um, what some of the challenges are, what some of our understandings are, our breakthroughs, our insights, and be able to share this. Um, but it's even in some of the more recent discoveries, uh, being able to look at and being able to understand that we've got new classifications of dugout boats and not seen before, then have returned back to the old records and realised that because of the poor recording, we weren't aware that they're actually sitting there already within the record and we're actually being able, as a consequence of this now in Ireland, being able to start to see some you know, regional variations. Uh, then there's also the, the point of, of retention, what do we do? These are costs, I think everything has a budget sort of requirement. Uh, you know, there's a cost of conservation, but then if we conserve, what are we going to do with, with these boats? Uh, do we display them? 
perhaps they're in too much of a degraded sort of condition to be able to present to the, um, the wider sort of public uh, for them to be able to fully understand and appreciate you know, what, they're, what they're looking at. Um, you know, so if we take them away from their, their site, uh, there's obviously a requirement for storage. So how do we store them? How do we maintain that? That's a cost as well. Um, but there's also sort of, if we deposit them back in the, uh, in the lake, um, uh, back in the lake water or in the, or in the river, um, these environments are very dynamic, they're very sort of fluid, and the boats rarely stay in the same location, even when there's an apparent sort of zero sort of current. So potentially there's a cost in loss of information. But then one of the biggest sort of costs is a social sort of one as well, that there are instances in which the boats are left on the river bank or on the lake shore. And that cost, you know, you know it gives the illusion to the broader sort of public that we don't care if we leave them there like this. So we have a responsibilities in terms of how we manage uh, the, you know, the, uh, the dugout boats with very limited sort of financial resources. But this all uh, this adds into uh, being able to you know, create typologies as well. Uh, I know Beth has done a lot of work on the typologies of uh, dugout boats, as have other sort of practitioners, such as Sean McGrail as well. But again, with these new sort of discoveries, with these uh, new nuances within the features and the whole sort of designs we're finding sort of subclassifications as well. So quite often there can be you know, more papers written about the challenges of typologies than there is about the uh, being able to create sort of uh, typologies, but it's down to how um, they're also interpreted as well. Um, so in relation to the incidences of discoveries, uh, we have about 391 recorded instances. And again, there's varying degrees of uh, records. Some of them can just be several boats were found. How, how many is several? How long is a piece of string? Um, uh, sometimes but there's no records in terms of the year or the circumstances or the month and so on. But these are the ones that, that we actually have. Um, you know, so you can see that in the mid-1800s uh, that there was uh, an increase, in, if you like, in the discovery of boats. And uh, it was happening also again in the uh, mid-1900s where you can see it peaked there. And uh, this is uh, down to sort of human interaction in terms of working within the water sort of environment. But I'll, I'll come to that again anyway. But then looking at it, seeing if there's any understanding as well in terms of the months in which the, or the times of the year in which these boats were, were, were found. Uh, it can be argued that the, what we're seeing there in the bottom graph there is uh, times of, um, uh, of, of, of flood activity, uh, you know, whether there's boats being washed up, you know, from, uh, you know, November through to, uh, through to January, and then maybe going into sort of the uh, drought periods at other times of the, of the year. But of course, like, I mean, the, you know, the situation with um, the global warming, it's making it more sort of challenging. It's bucking all these sort of trends in terms of the months in which we might find them. Uh, so um, in, in terms of human and uh, natural events, just 200 votes in Ireland have been recorded. Um, uh, you know, the circumstances of, of the recovery. And unsurprisingly, 125 of them have been through human you know, activity and 85 through uh, natural weather events. But I would argue that uh, perhaps there's a greater number of discoveries or uh, greater number of boats being turned up and brought, brought up during natural weather events. But on one side, that they're not being recognized for what they are. And in the other side of it as well is perhaps no one has been there to see them. You no, know, because obviously with human activity, you can see the boats as we discover them with natural weather events. Maybe there are more that are actually occurring that have gone un unnoticed. You know, it's the classic case of, you know, if a bear goes to the toilet in the woods or if a tree falls over in the woods and no one is there, you know, did it ever really happen? Um, so um, in looking at the, um, uh, you know, the, the actual sort of uh, periods of, uh, flood activity or, 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 or drought sort of periods as well. Um, we've got, uh, as I said, 85 of them from national, um, natural events and uh, 36 have come from, um, uh, from low water um, levels and all those for 18 from sea, you know, periods that were coincident with, uh, with low water as well, uh, 29 from flooding. So just interesting sort of statistics from what we have available. This is one that we have from bog slip which is um, you know, previous sort of lake that has turned into bogland. 
Uh, this could be human activity that generated or it might be a natural event. But um, again, we have the 125 of them and uh, we have 19 of them have been from sports uh, activities. Um, but incredibly, 106% of them have occurred uh, during um, actual sort of work, but only 30% of them from actual archaeological work. The rest of them have uh, come from uh, Pacific sort of events, such as our uh, river dredging, you know, turf cutting, um, some lake drains to, uh, to some degree. So there is going to be, uh, I believe, like with our global warming, there's going to be an increase in the prevalence of boat discoveries through natural weather events, but also that there's the contentious uh, process of doing river dredgings to straighten courses, which I, I, I don't agree with myself, but certainly uh, you can see that previous river dredgings have turned up a huge amount. So I think it's good to focus on these aspects. But again, it's always the more data that's available, you know, the, uh, the better uh, we're able to be able to understand the boats, be able to collate the data and be able to give uh, your interpretations to them. But again, it's always the record keeping. So uh, in terms of you know, the merging patterns, um, as, I said, as I said, there's increasing propensity, uh, I believe, for um, boats to be discovered you know, from uh, different weather cycles and perhaps from the human activities relating to those uh, you know, weather events and the, uh, the practices of ameliorating uh, you know, you know, against flood or drought sort of activities and of course there's the weather pursuits. So it's very important in terms of, uh, I, I believe, being able to engage with these sort of activities as archaeologists and the practitioners, the people who do the dredging and, and so on, so that uh, you know, we can inform, we can train, and we can um, uh, basically uh, be able to capture the boats as, as they, as they um, are found and be able to record them. Um, but part of the process as well that we're looking at is uh, in terms of training that a lot of archaeologists, uh, as I said, the terrestrial archaeologists, they may see us as being aliens or maybe they're the alien species if you like, um, but it's important that we actually uh, give a process for them to be able to understand and be able to record um, the boats. And if you think that a normal dry land excavation, we have record sheets, we have a process in which archaeologists record every sort of facet of you know, the excavation. So why not have ones for the dugout boats and why not you know, train them in this regard? So um, as I was saying, you know, training is a very important process. This is uh, some photographs on the River Foyle uh, in Northern Ireland and it was uh, the circumstances of two dugout boats that were found there that the uh, Northern Irish uh, National Monument Services archaeologists attended you know, for, for training uh, so they could understand exactly what to record, and it was very important in that sort of sense because uh, in their capacity, in their engagement, in their outreach, you know, with communities and with professional archaeologists, that, uh, you know, it's like if you train the trainer, that they can actually pass on the process of how to record these boats so that data is not lost, you know, from archaeologists that don't otherwise know how to do it. Uh, it's also important, I believe, to be able to promote awareness um, you know, of, uh, of the discoveries as they happen, when they happen. So that we're actually reaching out as part of this intangible heritage and making it more accessible to the broader sort of community because we're the custodians and, you know, of, of their heritage. And if we engage, you know, the community, they become stakeholders, they become interested, they become custodians and they can actually look out on, when they're walking on the river bank or on the lake shore uh, to find whatever archaeology there may be. Um, but it's also important, I think, you know, to include archaeological societies as well. This is uh, was training with a replica dugout boat, um, um, Nautical Archaeological Society, archaeologists how to, uh, from the UK, uh, how to uh, record um, you know, the dugout boats. And these are amateur practitioners as well, so it's very important to be able to bring them in we used to have, um, in the 90s, an organisation that was comparable to them in Ireland. It was the Irish Underwater Archaeology Research Team, but uh, I, I don't know what happened to it. It seemed to you know, uh, die out or whatever. Perhaps it might be you know, great to be able to take these people as the amateurs and uh, amateur archaeologists, and that they work within the, you know, or they, they engage within the uh, water environment and be able to include them in the process. 
Uh, we also have things like uh, in Ireland uh, the Adopt a Monument sort of scheme where uh, county archaeologists work with uh, local communities as well so they actually become engaged and excised with their local heritage. So why not do something like this with um, you know, the, uh, the, the dugout boats within the rivers and the lakes. And um, of course one of the important sort of things is radiocarbon dating as well. Quite often um, these boats they're recorded and they're placed back into the water because obviously there's the resource sort of issue, but then there's the issue of uh, obtaining carbon dates from them. And it can be a one-time sort of lost opportunity uh, that if we don't you know, get the sort of samples. And if you think when we undertake an ordinary dryland archaeological excavation, we come away through the post-excavation process with radiocarbon dates or dating by uh, ceramics or by, by other mechanisms, the dugout boats as we were talking yesterday, you know, are the context. They are the archaeological site quite frequently because of the dynamic environment where they're deposited. So the location where they're deposited isn't necessarily going to give us a date for the boat. So it's very important as an archaeology 101 that we do, you know, seek to have the dates because with, with the 500 um, boats, now admittedly going back into the 19th century, but about 11% of them have been dated, which is a very small, you know, number. Um, so it'd be great to be able to you know, change that. Um, another sort of process I'd postulate on is continuing professional development, that we have things like the Institute of Archaeologists of Ireland as a professional network body. They do uh, training of their archaeologists as an ongoing sort of process, and we can engage with this, like we did with the uh, National Monument Services archaeologists in Northern Ireland. And, uh, Again, there's the position sort of a retention and conservation and that cost uh, factor. One of the things that I was talking to with Mirren in 2015 or 2016 um, was the Ljubljana River uh, in Slovenia that um, there's a, an old quarry that's flooded beside it and uh, that's now used by the University of Ljubljana. Um, perhaps uh, Loba might correct me on that, but uh, my understanding of it is that different faculties or different departments had their corners of this quarry and they were able to do for their research information and um, Mira was, was explaining that it's either that they um, keep timbers, they keep large uh, archaeological sort of timbers you know, re retained within the lake or else that there was talking that this is a process that they were going to engage in. Uh, it's something that uh, is looked at and be sought as a possibility, as a cost-effective measure uh, within um, the Monument Services of Northern Ireland at the moment. They have two artificial lakes and the idea is instead of maybe leaving the boat on the river bank or putting it back in the water, why it might drift off and, and we lose it and that's the lost opportunity in terms of being able to return and be able to do any further recording. That maybe uh, we don't have the budget to conserve or to display or to restore, uh, that perhaps you know, we take it, we transport it off, and we deposit it within this more stable and more manageable and controlled environment in which it is, can be kept uh, and, and stabilized and maintained. So I'm just going to finish off uh, then saying, look, it's, um, I'm, I'm, these are ideas and discussion points that I've had an individual sort of basis with archeologists over the last several years, and uh, be very interested in seeing what ideas that uh, other people here have, um, you know, agreements, disagreements, so on, that maybe have a debate, that we can generate something that could be very good archaeological sort of practice and a route through for uh, overcoming any of these sort of challenges that we have and um, be able to create a good pathway for the future. But of course, we have to observe the Valletta Convention within the European Union as well. So, that's it. thank you. That's great, Niall, and you're we're catching up on our little time loss this morning. Um, so again, write your questions down because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions on the log boats. Um, we now have, are moving from Ireland on the periphery of Europe, we're moving to Eastern Europe for our next two speakers. And um, it's, I was talking to um, Barbora this morning, um, Machova, and she works for the Institute of Cass in Prague, and um, she works in cultural sciences in the Czech Republic, and um, she had a very good paper in the in Journal of uh, Nautical Archaeology on um, evaluating river finds and the challenges that they present. 
so I'm lovely to welcome you here, <laughs> Bob Ora, and I hope I got your name right. And uh, okay. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy that I can be here, and uh, of course I would like to thank the organizers for their amazing job. So let's start. It's a little frustrated to have the presentation after these uh, amazing presentations because we are re really moving to the country where the, the development of the archaeology is uh, uh, in the very low level. So, the Czech Republic is located in the central Europe, which means that we have no access to the sea. We have only small or medium-sized rivers. Our six nations expect an archaeological traces. Our lakes so, uh, are so protected and valued that even swimming in them, for these reasons, our research focuses only on the rivers. The river archaeology has no tradition in the Czech Republic. Nevertheless, several, several very important researches in the field of river archaeology took place in our country. The first of them took place in the first half of the of 20th century. In the picture, you can see uh, the river Elbe in uh, the area called Porta Bohemica. Here, uh, during, um, uh, the, uh, during dredging of the riverbed, at least uh, 80, bronze, 80 bronze artifacts, often of a luxurious nature, were discovered. Uh, artifact can be dated to the young and uh, bronze age. Uh, here, we can see a large area uh, with a massive fortifications. However, its interpretation is still not clear. It dates back to the Bronze Age, then partly to the early Middle Ages. The ritual area is most often mentioned as its purpose. The place where the bronze artifacts were found is sometimes carefully associated with the site above the river, and one of the interpretations is that the artifacts were placed in the river as a votive deposit. Another possible interpretation is that it would be the logboat's sunken cargo. I personally agree with the second option. A second very important excavation took place in the second half of the 20th century in a well-known early medieval Great Moravian center of Mikulčice. Here, a large area of buried branches of the Morava River, which originally surrounded the center part of the hill fort, was uncovered. The research uncovered three wooden bridges here, 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 and here, four log boats, and a large amount of small artifacts, including artifacts made from the organic materials, such as wood and wicker. The large-scale research provided us uh, with a unique insight into the river archaeology of early medieval centers. Apart from these two important excavations, however, river archaeology in the Czech Republic was not developed in uh, any way. At the beginning of 21st century, Jason Rogers noticed this technician and decided to process Czech log boats as a part of his PhD thesis at University of Exeter. His work is still the most important study dealing with log boats in our country. Jason found out up to, um, that up to 40 log boats were recorded in our country, but only about half have survived to this day. The most of them are undated. The oldest one is dated to the Latin period, here in Mohelnice site. And the youngest one is dated to the first half of 17th century. Uh, it's a log boat from the Taya River in Břeclav. So in 2015, under my leadership, a group of volunteers, volunteers formed a team for underwater archaeology in the Czech Republic. This initiative, uh, was create, uh, this initiative was created as a part of my doctoral studies. We started thinking about how to systematically approach the topic of underwater archaeology in our country. So we started with the uh, prospecting of interesting and potential archaeological sites. On the picture, you can see the state of the excavations from 2019. In 2016, we, de we decided to reach out to experts uh, in a sonar system and made the first tries to survey the riverbed. In the picture, you can see the remains of the early medieval monastery on, a San on the island of St. George in the Moldau River. The monastery was founded at the end of 10th century and destroyed uh, in the half of 15th century. 
uh, in this part of the river, uh, we carried out bottom measuring using static sonar, which showed us a number of anomalies under the water, like here, 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 and on uh, many more places. Uh, during the diving, we found out that these are the building elements of the monastery, some of them with the remains of the wood components. Our next goal was to set up a system for basic registration and, cl and classification of river finds. In the picture, you can see, for example, the special distribution of the river finds from the Morava River. Also, we focused on origin of the river find. On the picture in the right, on the graph in the right, you can see that the most of the river finds from Morava River were discovered by river regulation is the orange line. Gray line are river finds with unknown origin and the blue line means river finds which were discovered accidentally. During the river regulation were dredged a lot of finds including log boats uh, here in this place in Uherské Hradiště and uh, Staré Město towns and the local archaeological association brought together enthusiasts. Uh, this, graph, this graph can show us that the local people were more attentive to archaeological finds after river regulation. Uh, because our central archaeological information system don't in, uh, doesn't include a single finds from the understandable re reasons, we needed to set up uh, our own system and decide how we would record and classify the archaeological river components. So we decided to record all archaeological components uh, up to a distance of uh, 300 meters from the water course and in water course, of course. So on the picture in the right, you can see the example of very simple front page of each river component. Other relevant metadata are also linked to the uh, page. For example, you can see uh, the rondel close to the Isera River. Is it possible to see it? Uh, after recording, uh, we needed to decide how we will classify the archaeological river finds or components. Our simple classification should help to protect our underwater archaeological heritage uh, before an inter inter intervention in rivers. We divided the archaeological, rivers, uh, ar archaeological river finds into five basic categories which would tell to investor how big archaeological potential in selected area should be expected. Category A uh, very shortly means closed archaeological uh, complex, uh, and it, it should say be extremely, a bit, be extremely careful here. Uh, B means archaeological area finds possible link to the land archaeological structure. It should, it should say be very careful here. And C means archaeological solitary finds, so be careful here, but relax. Category, uh, categories uh, D and E are special and need an individual approach. Despite uh, the fact that we have tried to popularize our activities, water management companies are still not used to announcing the start of construction or regulatory activities on the rivers. The picture shows a log boat found in the Taya River in the spring of 2019. It was dredged from the bottom of the river and uh, its discover discovery was reported by a local citizen who was walking with, with, with his dog. The interesting is that the um, log boat was found in the uh, already, already regulated river. At the end of 2021, we were awarded a grant project that deals with the Yizera River from the perspective on interdisciplinary cooperation between archaeology and hydrology. The project allowed us to fully devote ourselves to combination of different devices and approaches. For example, you can see the use of very simple hummingbird sonar as well as the more sophisticated river survivor sonar. We usually measure a large area with a hummingbird, and when we find some potential area, we use river survivor with much better resolution. Uh, we supplement the measurement of the riverbed with uh, geophysical prospecting and other selected methods. The aim of this project was to determine so-called contact zone. Uh, this is our working name for a place where, where people simply interact with the river. Following that, we try to define place, uh, places with archaeological potential in rivers. And also, of course, we would like to find new logboats. 
uh, based on the sonar results, we are able to identify places uh, with a sediment, ten sediment, ten sediment tension potential in selected sections in the riverbed where archaeological material can be uh, accumulated. On the picture left, we can see the new archaeological site. We try to determine uh, the extent of the settlement by comparing different old maps, which we vectorized into this form. Settlement can be probably dated uh, to the prehistory and then to the medieval age. The settlement is located in promontory, and from top of it leads the old path to the fort. You can see the Isera River around uh, the settlement and fruit plain where we made some geo geophysical prospection, but in the uh, uh, area of fruit plain we found nothing. But uh, geophysical prospect prospecting of the settlement on promontory showed us a possible fortification. We made a quick check under the water with underwater metal detector and found a large quantity of recent material including a rifle and medieval horseshoe in the space of sediment tension cone. Ah, sorry. Another tested case uh, was microregion Piscova Alhota. It's on, it's, it's on the picture in, uh, in the right. Uh, both banks of the Isera River in this area were intensively, intensively populated. Green Hill Fort on the right side of the bank uh, is dated to Hallstatt and Latin period. The purple hill fort uh, northern is dated to the early medieval age. The yellow color um, on the left bank uh, shows prehistoric settlement and the red, red color represents medieval fort. These are four forts in the river. Uh, the, the river is not regulated, but we found absolutely nothing here. So, uh, therefore, we focused on Isera River fluid plain area and on a reconstruction of historical paths uh, and shifts of river meanders. In the picture, you can see the geophysical prospecting of the buried uh, river meander. Furthermore, here you can see the electrical resistance uh, tomography RT, uh, of the historical path that leads from the Purple Hill Fort. Uh, to the uh, old river Meandre. Uh, we believe that in the past the river flowed through this space and therefore today's uh, flow is devoid of signs of the activities of past societies. For next year, uh, we plan to carry out OSL dating of selected meanders and we would like to connect the, uh, the hill fort with um, the, the old meanders. Despite all our efforts and enthusiasm, there is one fundamental thing holding us back. It's a lack of stable human resources. My great team is made up uh, of people whose primary job is not river archaeology. Uh, the fact that we do not have a uh, ratified UNESCO convention only reflects very little interest, uh, interest in this archaeological specialization. So, uh, I met Miran Eric in 2015 in Croatia during my advanced underwater archaeology course organized by uh, the ICWA team from Zadar. Uh, Miran was very kind to me and wished me luck with the river archaeology in the Czech Republic. But he, also be, but he also told me that it would be very difficult, and it was. But the hardest thing is when you are alone for the whole job. And for many reasons, you know that there is no way to secure funding to develop a stable team. For that reason, I accepted uh, offer to work on high-speed rail project as an archaeologist. Our river project will finish at the end of the next year. After that, I will be happy if I will continue doing underwater archaeology, but just as a hobby. So thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you the best luck with your projects. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much, Barbara. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting. I'm sure you'd love to talk to Carl about managing the resources. Um, we have an extra speaker um, on the program, um, and I think it's going to be an online presentation. Um, it's from Ekaterina Kashina, and it's about the dugouts with carved bulkheads in Eastern Europe. Um, and she's, she's looking at types, form, size, and radio, radiocarbon dating. Uh, as far as I can gather from her profile, Katrina, uh, Katrina is um, an expert in prehistorical portable art. Um, she looks at sculptures, tools, um, pottery in 
the Eastern European forest zone, and uh, her work has a wide reach from the Mesolithic into the Bronze Age and earlier, and um, she looks at bone and antler from hunter-gatherers, and uh, this has actually gone into looking at dugout boats. So I'll let the technological guys uh, look after this one. So uh, welcome, um, Ekaterina Kashina. I think if we can ask, there are um, personnel from both, if they can put on the Katrina's recording. If you have it there, please. Video. This is? Um, no. Yeah. Any? Well, hello. We're jumping ahead of ourselves on the program here. That's a uh, uh, speaker to follow later on. No, no, no. It's Peter. No, make it ring. E K A T E R I M A. It's not there. Yeah. No. Somewhere else. Another day. Okay. This is a second. Right. I think uh, we, we seem to have lost uh, Ekaterina's uh, presentation, so, um, so our apologies about that, and also to Ekaterina, but we, we will make sure to have time uh, you know, to include our presentation somewhere else in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the, the conference. Um, so, uh, so apologies to all parties, and uh, I'm sure it'll be something else to look forward to as we, as we progress on. So if we have Dorina, who's chairing there, um, uh, I think she wants to make an introduction of uh, some people here. So have we lost Dorina as well? She's, uh, she's left the building. Elvis has left, left the building. Um, okay. Uh, so um, I know that um, we have a, a couple of Greek colleagues here that, um, that Dorina was going to introduce us to. Um, so perhaps if they, if they were to uh, give a presentation our paper or give a poster, but I know that during the um, organizing of everything that uh, some things were lost in translation and uh, you know, for whatever reason that we, we, we missed them. So um, if they can make themselves known, if they'd like to, yeah, oh, here we are. Yeah, if you want to wish to come down. There's Serena there, I see her. She hasn't left the building. Okay, she's just leaving me to carry the can. 
So uh, I'll hand it over to her down there now. Anyway, okay, thank you. So Niall, Babora, Carl, and I just want to introduce uh, Christine uh, Papola. She uh, works with logboats in Greece, and she just wants to. She came here to talk to people, uh, compare, contrast, like we all are. Yeah. So, uh, do, would you like to say something? Yes. Well, um, sorry, putting you on the spot. She wasn't expecting to be. Up here. Yes, I, I did. I did set an abstract, but then I never got a reply, so I didn't expect to be here to talk to you. Uh, but I am happy that I am around and that I'm listening to all these interesting talks. Well, I am a prehistoric archaeologist uh, studying the Stone Age. Um, in Greece we have a big tradition with navigation but not uh, for the Stone Age. So what we want to do, um, there's a, a postdoctorate program that I'm working on. Uh, we're trying to um, find out how feasible it is to produce a logboat by using napped stone tools, no metal, and no Neolithic uh, axes. So we just started last summer. Um, uh, the, the napped tools that we used see, seem to be more durable than we thought at first. Uh, but we haven't finished the, the boat yet, um, and we also started testing the use of fire, controlled fire, and I hope that by the end of next summer we will have our results and we will be able to discuss about it, this. Um, now, why are we doing it? <laughs> because um, we have uh, indirect evidence of um, sea crossings in the Mediterranean, but the oldest boat found uh, is Neolithic. But we do have uh, evidence of Mesolithic um, navigation. Uh, so we want to uh, indirectly try to understand if it would be able to use these types of boats in order to cross to the islands, in short. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, you were great. Oh, I put her on the spot. I was talking to her yesterday, but yeah, it's all about networking. We're all just a little crazy about boats here, <laughs> so you're in the right company. Um, there's maritime archaeologists, and then there's people who are just into watercraft, so there's a subset. Um, I think we need the mic for questions. I'm sure there's loads from the floor there. Um, I just want to kick off one. I have about 10 questions. I'll have to get you in the bar afterwards. Um, just, I'm always looking at transfer of culture with skin boats. Um, I presume all the, there's so many logboats across Europe, this is a non-logboat person, um, and some of the features seem similar. I mean, is it the same response to a problem of having to get a float and the technology of the time? Or, to me, it looks like there was some sort of major transfer of technology across Europe with the similarities. It's just putting it out to the logboat people. Do you think this transfer of culture similarities, or do you think they were, everybody was working in isolation? Um, I, I think there's definitely a transfer of uh, uh, culture information across Europe. I can see the same trends happening, um, same features turning up on Bronze Age boats that are happening in, in Germany or Denmark or other parts of Europe. So it, it's, it's, we, we can see with other material culture that um, information is, 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 is moving, technology is moving across Europe over time. And whether it's you know with spears or pottery or megalithic tombs or building types, um, we see influx of new peoples, whether it's the Beaker folk um, or other people. And along with that, we, we, we get the, the transfer of technology of the boats too. So in Ireland, you know, in the Bronze Age, the boats are quite similar to, to boats in, in, in Europe. 
Um, there might be local peculiarities or features, but definitely mm -hmm. it's in that broad trend. Um, and some of the boats I've spoken about, I didn't speak about, again, like we were getting the introduction of sewing plank boats probably in Ireland in the Middle Bronze Age. Um, we see that happening maybe a little bit later than in Britain, but you know, by a couple of centuries. But you know, the Irish are speaking to the English, who are speaking to the French, who are speaking to the, mm -hmm. the Spanish, who are speaking to the, the rest of Europe. So you know, why not, if, if all the other material culture is, 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 is transferring from one country to another over time, it's, I think it's the same. The same bits. Yeah. yeah, I think early man was a lot more mobile than we give yeah. them credit for. I mean, I think they were doing fairly long journeys in fairly what we call primitive boats now. Um, I'm going to paraphrase uh, Mirren here on my opening uh, comment. Uh, he uh, was always get very excised when uh, people who talk about, and archaeologists talk about the invention of the wheel, about being the most significant sort of development after fire to humankind. Uh, very excised and say, no, it's boats, you know, it's watercraft, early watercraft. That was more fluid sort of means of communication. Mm -hmm. So like Carl was saying, there is that transfer sort of cultural um, mixes, if you like, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, that integration, um, you know, and that form of sort of communication sort of networks. One of the things that we do focus on um, as broad practitioners is obviously the dugout boats, because by their very non-composite, single uh, piece nature, they survive the archaeological record much better than um, the, uh, the composite, you know, contemporaries. And that longevity in the record really sort of shows through like from uh, nearly 7,000 BC in Ireland to 1753 AD. Um, Paris in Denmark, it's 8,000 BC. Uh, the dugout boats, they, you know, uh, can be notoriously difficult to date just by uh, visual examination, if you like. Some of the indicators can be features like sort of tool marks can be indicators. But um, there, are, um, there are emerging sort of patterns as well as we sort of look at uh, the parallels across Europe as well. So it shows like you I mean that, that is there, there is that sort of cultural sort of transference as well. But having said that, at the same time, we're also sort of seeing as we uh, get better data records that um, there are sort of regions, regional sort of groupings and just type of posts that are just completely unique to one sort of river. Uh, or water catchment as well. So th there, there is a cross sort of you know, emerging, and I think it's some it's down to the dynamic of human interaction or human engagement, um, that there are those, like the modern sort of period, like as us now, uh, we share information, we share knowledge, um, while you know, there are others that perhaps the tradition is to pass the heritage down from master craftsman to master craftsman and keep the trade secret, mm -hmm. you know, if you like, because maybe that's their success, like the Nello, you know, kayaks, sports kayaks we saw yesterday, you know, they have their trade secrets. So there could be that in terms of them being able to use that as an economic sort of generation, mm -hmm. because boats are very, very important in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, cultural identity, mm -hmm. but also sort and of- status. Uh, yeah, status yeah. and also sort of communication across different the, societies. In, in the voyage tales, the uh, Iron Age voyage tales, like the, the larger boats went with the big tribes in skin boats. <laughs> so, right, we'll um, throw it open to the floor here. Uh, questions? Somebody? <laughs> yet. Thank you. I am very impressed by the task in Ireland with your logboats. Much uh, luck that you are able to manage all this. You have a, a crazy material, and uh, I hope it shall be soon possible to read something about that. It's a big task, and with La Carbe, a lot of our work was done behind the scenes when we first found the boats because we were afraid that divers would come in and just start taking everything and once the word got out, we were afraid that the divers would destroy the artifacts, intentionally or unintentionally. Some people are just curious, but the log boats are so fragile, the artifacts are so fragile. So we've been keeping a lot of, a lot of that work quiet. Um, and 
you know, we still keep a lot of it quiet. There are some sites which I'm not allowed to talk about as well, which we've which, which found, which are quite exciting. But I'm hoping to, to get the information released at some stage. Um, it's, a, it's a balance between internal politics, you know, government politics. We have to regulate these sites. We have to try and protect them. Sometimes protecting them is by not announcing you you found them, which is not a good policy. I'd be all on for sharing the information, getting it out there, publicising it. Because um, when you publicise some of those fines, they get people get excited, you know, and then they will encourage other people to get involved as well. And um, but we are also a small team. We're a very small team, and we have a huge task. We, like, you know, early watercraft is just one part of it. It's part of my passion. Um, I've been working on log boats for 25 years now, and um, you know, um, we just don't have the resources to share as much information as, as we would like. But we want to keep continue doing the work so that it's done. Because if we stop doing it, it may it may not start. It may not continue. You know, the challenges in trying to get government to stay involved and active in this, it's, it's, a, it's a battle in its own right. We are always fighting for resources, sometimes for our own existence, because all this stuff is underwater and out of sight is out of mind. And it's slow, it's tedious, it's expensive. Um, there's a lack of people. And if the senior people in the department can't do it or see it, sometimes they don't know about it. So it's a constant battle to try and keep it going. Um, and But in saying that, we, we probably still survive because of the important sites we found and then being able to announce them, whether it's a Spanish Armada shipwreck or you know, a, a log boat and, and so on. But we, we, I agree, publication is key. And now that we're coming to the end of our initial assessment phase, um, we, we have a plan in place now to bring out a series of publications on these finds, um, which will involve including a lot of different experts from you know, from, from different areas because we're, we're dealing with Stone Age right up to to the 16th century. It's a huge range of um, material to deal with, you know. But again, in the context, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, it's in the context of w we have a wider brief team with all shipwrecks, you know, and, you know, we're here for early watercraft. Um, you know, in next month I'll be at a conference dealing with people who are into 17th century stuff and they want everything now. <laughs> like they want all the information and, and all the data and it's hard to keep Everybody happy, but I'm, I'm enough. But my, my heart is, is in is in are in log boats, and hopefully we will get more information out. And I do have a paper coming out early next year on in the ICUA proceedings, which discusses some of the log boats. So that's that, that that's kind of a. We, we, I do have one or two other papers from before, but smaller papers. But that's the start of it, and we hope to bring out a series of monographs on on, on the boats. So thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, another. In, in the side yet. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for some fantastic talks. Um, with respect to, to Carl, uh, it, it was interesting your idea about the, the, some of them were killed because I was uh, very impressed with all of your videos, uh, seeing that they're all uh, sort of very well laid and sort of right side up, right? Uh, so I was thinking about you know these finds in the middle of the lake. Um, what does it take to sink a log boat, right? Uh, because if it's in a lake and you have some catastrophic event, right, uh, you'd expect that it would float and maybe come to the edge of the lake. So uh, I, I was wondering if you could speculate a little bit more about what type of events, in addition to, to killing of boats intentionally, would get them to be deposited in the ways that you're finding them. Yeah, it's a good question, and it's a question that comes up quite often. It's like, wh why did these boats sink, or how did they sink? Um, obviously, some some of them just sank. They're out in the lake, and they got caught up in bad weather, and became waterlogged. And um, you know, maybe with the aid of a stone, in it, they, they, they they would have sank quite easily. The ones that are carrying stone, you can imagine that they would sink very easily um, because they're just way down. And once the water gets inside them, they lose their buoyancy and. Can, can sink quite quickly. But a lot of these boats, if they've been used over time, you know, would have been basically waterlogged themselves. So they're almost like the same density as water. So they then become, um, um, can, can sink. Um, but I have seen videos like in the, in the Far East of log boats that just, just, just floating below the water. But they tend to be, you know, probably not oak, 
other, 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 other woods which are more buoyant, where, where, where oak is quite dense and heavy. And um, so once they get water allowed, um, they lose their buoyancy and, and can, can sink quite quickly. And if there's any sort of weight in them, whether it's people or stone, other cargoes, which might, you know, which might have floated off or dissolved over time, um, so they, they would sink quite quickly. But having been in a log boat myself, they also tip over so easily, so I'm impressed that they still have things inside of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, look, they're, 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 whilst they're stable in, 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 in flat cam water, um, the freeboard isn't, isn't very large in a lot of these boats, so um, you know, they could easily get swamped. And I'm sure there's a lot of bailing of water on these boats, um, but maybe Cyril could tell us more about that tomorrow. <laughs> but, um, just to, have you looked a lot of small traditional boats, especially the old river cots, that they're actually stored wet. They sink them partially yeah. to keep the them expanded and the caulking and stuff. So a lot of boats around the place. Sometimes then they just sink when they get too much rain. Yeah. And so I was wondering where they'd fall out. So Drina, if I may just oh, yeah. uh, come in there also just uh, answer Michael's question. It takes very very little. Uh, it takes nothing, um, especially in larger lakes where there's wave generation. These boats are very heavy. Um, in terms of uh, the timber density, mo the vast majority of the boats in Ireland are oak. Uh, the modern uh, timber industry says that green oak is around about 700 kilos per cubic meter. But when you're making these actual boats, they're fresh, they're green. We're looking at between 900 and 1,100 kilos per cubic meter. Water is 1,000 kilos, so they're naturally going to sink. As Carl says, they ride very low in the water, so very little freeboard. But that also means that if there's any sort of sense of open water and wave generation, there are poor reactors to the waves, so they'll swamp, they'll swamp and sink. They're less of a lateral stability issue, you know, so they're less likely to roll and capsize, but that depends on the actual cross-sectional hull shape as well. Um, you know, in terms of the, uh, that stability as well, that uh, quite often I think you'll find that the north end of the tree, side of the tree trunk is the one that's on the bottom because it's got the higher timber density and gives a better sort of um, you know, stability. Um, but one of the things like uh, in your paper there, Carl, you're saying about the, the stone that was mm. in the boat and um, it's certainly very interesting you know, that the amount of limestone that's locally available that they don't need to carry that. But um, with these boats, they're also very, very good at carrying cargo. So either they ride low in the water with each incremental amount of load that's actually put in it, the, it's um, a significantly lesser amount that it actually uh, rides lower in the water. We did experiments um, in Northern Ireland in this in the 1990s, uh, just loading up uh, boats that we made. And uh, it was actually surprising. I, I can't, don't have the figures to hand, but it's actually really amazing the weight that they would actually carry. I think it was more an issue really of um, the cargo and what type of cargo because they're confined by the size of the hull and how much they could actually, they could actually carry. But uh, again, in, in some of your, your paper there, Carl, you showed um, that there were sort of single stones yeah. in the boat, which I find very interesting because one of the things that I've looked at is a directional stability of the boats. Mm -hmm. um, that the differing density from the tree trunk can actually cause it to skew one way or the other. Even though you might have had crafted a perfectly streamlined hull, there's still that density. So, and I found through my own experimentation to compensate against that is having singular sort of stones placed expeditiously in the hull to counterbalance that and you know, create um, something that will actually as a consequence end up being able to go in the direction instead of going off one direction all the time. Yeah, I mean, counter slewing is, is potentially a, an answer to that, to, to what the stones are doing, but it's so regular, I, th I think there's possibly another function for them, and one is maybe an anchor, or it could be balancing yeah. the boat. Or boat. Or boat, or boat yeah, yeah. Um, but we find this you witty about this land, just right, right, kind of almost under a stone. Well, maybe it's part of a, there was a net or something, and, a, and this rope that, that, that they were using the boat if they were fishing and they wanted to save one spot where the salmon are running or the, the, the trout are are, are, are are sitting and um, it could be a way of just you know staying stable on, on the lake to carry out whatever function you want. Yeah, they have a lot of stone anchors in folk life in the museum. Yeah, yeah. The other thing just struck me one or two of your boats with a 
burn mark. Yeah. We did some work with with folklife people from the University College Cork, um, with like 19th century fishing mm -hmm. boats. We reenacted cooking on board. So these are wooden yeah. boats, but they actually just literally put a couple of stones. It's amazing. Like yeah. you're only this much from the wooden deck, and this is how they lived. They cooked heated water. Had and it's amazing. You think you're going to set your deck on fire, but you don't. They yeah. just had very rough bowls. Now we used a little three-legged Dutch type of pot, but um, we didn't want to put a hole in these valuable boats. But uh, so they did cook on board. So I'm just seeing those singular, you know, round patches. Yeah. Could have been left over from cooking. We don't know. It's it, one. Of, it's it one. Could, it could it's just when there's a single round. It's not like there was yeah. a big fire on board. It was a big fire, and it wasn't yeah. very intense. But it was enough to to char the surface of the boat, and you could see where the embers had fallen yeah. off, and just scorch, you know, so it looked like a one-off or maybe mm -hmm. two fires, but that's probably it, you know. Um, yeah. no, I, I've seen uh, cooking stones on carracks uh, that are being used in yeah. modern replicas, yeah, right? You could easily imagine someone spilling uh, some of their meal or something and catching fire yeah, or something. Yeah, because it's either just around, if it was a big fire, you would expect, you know, a lot to be burnt, or, yeah. but it, they seem very concentrated. It's just, just an idea, yeah. I mean, we don't know what they were really up to. It's just too... I had another comment, if I yep. can continue. I don't want to yeah, hog the, the microphone. But, but just in re reaction to the, the final um, uh, comma from Greece, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in North America, and uh, there there are no polished Neolithic axes, and people make fantastic dugouts, right? So uh, both using um, uh, napped uh, flints uh, as well as fire, and also steaming to bend, uh, bend wood. So, uh, uh, I think that the answer is, is quite clear if you look around the world that uh, there are lots of Stone Age uh, societies using uh, napped stone to build some actually fantastic and elaborate uh, dugout boats. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this can be done uh, and it has been done and it's been done all around the world uh, for a very long time uh, mm -hmm. by many different uh, cultures. So, um, so yes, absolutely. <laughs> And there are many examples uh, to, to look at if you look at the ethnographic literature. Mm -hmm. If I can say yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, yes, but uh, if you try to uh, discuss with colleagues uh, uh, studying the Paleolithic, it's very difficult to convince them that it was possible. So this, this was the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that in instigated our, our try. So we are replicating uh, stone tools that we find around the sites, trying to be as, as uh, mm -hmm. close to reality as we can. And I forgot to say that we also use the red deer antlers. Um, and hopefully we'll have some uh, bones as well, but we didn't in the first season. So I'm, I'm happy to discuss anything mm -hmm. after. Uh, actually, uh, Babora showed some slides from Jason Rogers, and he's now, I think, the state archaeologist for Alaska, and he's certainly worth contacting. Yeah, his wife is talking tomorrow. Uh, on, she's of a skimbo person. <laughs> we are actually in contact with Jason, so I yeah. can share the contact for him. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask Babora, just in relation to Czech Republic, there's no. Maritime, well, not maritime, riverine archaeologist in the state services. Nobody who looks after rivers or uh, if there's a development going on in the river, is there an archaeologist saying, oh, monitor or do a dive survey first in advance of your dredging? Or is there any, any action, activity like that? Mm -hmm. Understand. Uh, actually, I'm only one in the Czech Republic, and it was my goal to set up some uh, practicing and process uh, how we will uh, communicate with the investors in any way. And but they just close their eyes because they know they, they know very well because it's in our law that uh, they are they have to announce uh, all activities, even in the water. It's stayed in the law, they have to. But uh, because they were, they, they were no, um, uh, no tradition in this. So they just, oh, we didn't know that, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's yeah. 10 years. And I, I don't believe that they don't know, but just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think. That, oh, one well, more. Do you have questions? Oh, sorry, you've got well, well, first. I was going to do a wrap. <laughs> oh, okay. 
thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, love. Okay, thank you. It's good to know someone in the audience has my back. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I just Carla, it's just very interesting in terms of the uh, the work that you've been doing on the the Loch Carb, and I've talked to you there about it previously yeah. as well. And it's uh, absolutely phenomenal because it's it's Ireland's second largest lake, and for many years we just had a dearth of uh, boats, and it was just one of these sort of big question mark. We had um, the expression, you know, from um, time of English rule, you know, to hell or Connacht, and the Connacht is the region in the west of Ireland where the poor Irish were, were sent and it was poor I'd go to land if you like, you know. So it was like there's something, what's wrong with Connacht? Why isn't there more boats? So as Carl said, if you look, you find them. So it's absolutely phenomenal sort of work there. So first of all, I just want to just congratulate you and the underwater unit and everything you're doing in that. But I have some, some questions and some comments, yeah. as uh, I suppose you can imagine. Yeah. But um, just in relation to the, um, you know, Anna Keane boat, it's very interesting to see the, uh, the cross ribs and I, I know when we look at ribs that are carved in the solid, you know, it, it's very easy to say they are skeuomorphic, they are emulating skin or, or, or plank boats, but I think that the reason behind that may be just more sort of, you know, complex, because um, a lot of work goes into the boats, um, and if you think you want them to ride as high in the water as possible, when they're always having low freeboard because of their, of their weight, that's adding in extra sort of weight and it's not adding in any structural integrity, you know, because it's carved from the one, the one piece. Um, in relation to the, the Lurgan boat in the National Museum of Ireland, the 15 meter long one, um, I mean, I remain absolutely convinced that that's an unfinished, you know, boat. Um, the, um, I, I think at one point, the thickness of the bottom of the boat is nearly 40 centimeters. So that's excessive and they still have these longitudinal ribs and these cross ribs for all intents and purposes. So my speculation about this uh, particular boat is that it was a matter of our means of controlling the hollowing out process. Because when you try to take big chunks of the timber out, if you don't control it, you might end up pulling the side off in the construction process by accident and then you have no boat. So I, I'm uh, reasonably comfortable that this is a way of compartmentalizing the hollowing process. I, I don't know how um, you know, that compares to the Anna Keane boat, because that seems to be very well made and very well sort of finished. But my, 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 process, my thinking behind that would be um, that perhaps it could be something like functional, like uh, to create a bilge so that there might be sort of some form of planking or boarding sitting on top of that so that whatever cargo or persons are, you know, yeah. you know you're, you're, you're staying dry. And if I can just add, put two more points, if, I, if you can, or I'll let yeah, you. Yeah, we'll answer that, yeah. yeah. I, I, I disagree with you. I, I think Anakin is a finished surface. It's beautifully carved. Yeah. I agree from what I you agree. see, yeah. And it's, it's the exact same design as the Lurgan boat. And in Lurgan boat, you have these big sections, maybe two metres long. I don't think they're, they're hacking out two metre long sections of the boat in one piece, because that would be very uncontrolled. And, you know, I've looked at the Lurgan boat you know, a lot, and I, I, I think it is a finished surface. It mightn't look great today because it's a 100-year-old find. Um, and um, and then we have this other boat at, um, the name's escaped me, just a few kilometres away again, and it's the exact same design. And I think it would just be too much of a coincidence that, you know, just three boats, all the exact same date, all in the same area that were never <coughs> finished, and we're, we're seeing the remnants of the, 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 the hollowing out process. So I, I think it's a pre preconceived design um, for whatever reason, whether it's symbolic or something like that, I agree. Um, it's, not, it's not for struggle with integrity. I don't think it's so that sort you of can put boards in the boat, because if you're putting boards in the boat, well, then you're, you're actually making the boat heavier again. You know? So um, you know, I think if you're, if you're working these boats on a lake or river, you're going to get wet. You know, they're going to get splashes. So my feeling is that the Anakin, because it's so well finished, Lurgan boat, to me, looks finished. I agree, the Lurgan boat is really heavy, but I wonder was it ever sailed? And I wonder was it a ritual deposition? It's in a bog alongside a small river that leads in Loch Carb, and I wonder was it actually ne ne ever, never finished? And that's why it probably doesn't have the, the naval arch architectural qualities that you would want in a boat, and that they just said, look, let's build this boat, make it look nice, and make an offering. As we get with all sorts of you know, other kind of rituals, de depositions in the bogs and aren't, whether it's bog bodies or hordes of of axes and spears and, and stuff like that. So um, 
I think the three boats are finished and um, we'll probably never understand exactly what that design feature is for because it doesn't seem to have a functional feature. So yeah, I agree with you that the, uh, from what I see of the, the video of the Anakin boat, yeah. that, that looks very finely crafted and yeah. very finely finished, and it's, it's very compelling in terms yeah. of uh, mm. you know, your, uh, your postulating on it, if you like. Um, and uh, the Lurgan boat, I agree with you, is unfinished. Yeah. But certainly it, it does give uh, a lot of pause for thought, you know, in particular how you're able to compare the, the date ranges yeah. and those sort of comparable, uh, comparability of those three boats. But I suppose that sort of segues into my, my, my next one, if I yeah. may, um, that's on the Lees Island five boat, this yeah. ash boat. So that, that's quite unique within the Irish record that ash is, yeah. is used. Um, and uh, I, I, I know I talked to you a few years ago uh, about it from the limited evidence uh, or information that I had um, as postulating that this was designed as um, you know, a, a one-off use, if you like. Um, because the indicators were saying to me, you know, the thick floor, the thick sides, the sapwood running along the top, which wouldn't yeah. have stayed on for any length of time yeah. at all. Um, the, the placements of the, uh, of the seats, because they're quite unusual in the, um, in the Irish record where we've got the seats that are setting on a shelf on either mm -hmm. side, in, in, you know, instead of going through, mm. through, through the hull. Um, so I, I was just wondering, like, I mean, I, I know you disagreed with me at the time, you know, so I was just wondering what, yeah. you know, change in the meantime to, you know, for you to consider as a ritual deposition. Oh, well, no, I, I, in 2014, the published article was saying I told it was a, a ritual de deposition. I always okay. thought it was that, yeah. Um, I, I think it was used more than once because they lowered the seat. You know, if they wanted the seat, um, you know, if it was just for one purpose, they wouldn't have lowered the seat. They would have just built it with the seat lower down. Mm -hmm. So at some stage, they lowered the seat to, to facilitate uh, incorporating the axe into the boat, and then they could deposit it on, on, on the lake bed. So I agree, yeah, look, sa that much sapwood I've never seen before in a log boat. We, we sometimes yeah. get sapwood on the outsides, you know, yeah. very often, actually. More often than we think, and they're trying to use the full width of the boat of the tree without using too much sapwood. That one, it's very peculiar, it's ash. The top maybe ten or fifteen percent is is is, is sapwood. Yeah. You know, yeah. very soft. You yeah. know, you know, and wouldn't survive very long. But maybe it, it, it maybe it was an experimental log boat at the time. They wanted to have a log boat regatta, so, <laughs> and they said, Let, let's try this. Or, um, you know, it is possible it was purposely. You know, and this would kind of go against what I'm saying. So it is possible it was just purposely built for that ritual deposition, and they didn't want to use up a valuable oak tree for that, so they, they went for an ash tree instead. You know, which, yeah. my, which, which are reasonably common in the area at the time. So we certainly so, tend to make yeah. it gravitate more towards that it was designed for this. For this yeah, ritual, possibly, sort of yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's open to interpretation and... and um, yeah, of course. Um, just a final one, if yeah. I may, as well. Um, just with the Rabbit uh, Island boat, yeah. um, you, you showed obviously very yeah. uh, distorted grain yeah. and you've got the big knots and so on. Um, and I know from making boats with distorted grains, mm. it is just beyond thankless task, yeah. uh, especially if you're using replica tools. Um, but with the, um, with, with the number of holes on it there, um, I just did a quick sort of look at it, and it, it seemed to me that perhaps there, there were possibly three thickness gauges um, in, the, in, in the floor of the boat, and that the rest seemed to broadly sort of follow um, you know, lines across the boat, so they may have actually held um, you know, fitted ribs. And the, the reason why I say that is because uh, obviously uh, with uh, using a boat with lots of knots on it, mm. there's a structural weakness. It's, it has a poor sort of integrity and invariably starts to split and fall apart. That um, you know, the Bob has, uh, in his uh, master's thesis on looking on repairs and um, preventative repairs as well, you know, there is the fitted ribs you know, to use to hold the all together to stop mm. it from, from splitting. And I know if you're looking, drawing a line, it's much nicer to look at a straight line, yeah. and these ones will be more you know, skewed. But they, that, that's not um, you know, that precedent. Um, in the 1997-1998, uh, Aidan Sullivan was doing excavations on the River Shannon, uh, Clamacnoise Abbey, and the medieval bridge site, and there was uh, at least one boat there that had fitted ribs. But the yeah. fitted ribs, appear to use, uh, I know you're working on that side as well, yeah. um, to use branches 
rather than carved ones. So I suppose if nature provides something that provides a shape, why go to the trouble of trying to make a nicely crafted one if it's just to preserve a function? So that you know, you know the branches. You know, it could be something like similar to this that was used in the the Rabbit Island boat. Um, that they use that to yeah. you, you know to pull it all together. Uh, yeah. Look. Yeah. Interesting. I. We only did a quick dive in that boat, and we went and recorded. It was very dark. Um, from and I want to look at it again because th there is a, a plank to the side, or part of the boat from the side, which fell off, and lots of holes in it. And I'm wondering, was it part of a, an extended log boat? Um, possibly. Not sure. But I felt I need to go back to it again. But from memory, all the thickness gauge dowels were all level, and the preservation was good in the boat, and it didn't look like they were protruding up. That might have facilitated, you know the fitting of ribs. But curiously, there is a shadow going across the floor. It's like, I call it a shadow, but it's a, a lighter patch. It looks, it looks like there was a rib going across the floor, but not where just the dowel holes. So I, I, think, I think we'll have to look at it again. If we can get the opportunity to have a, a dive on it again and get better footage of it. You know, I can show you yeah. the video of it. It's all very dark, you know, and you did mention the good visibility. I don't show the bad visibility <laughs> photographs, and we have 99% <laughs> of our murky and dark, and we get the odd good day where we can get those good videos. Okay, great. great. Thanks for that, Carl yeah. and Niall, yeah. Babora and Christina, who was put, I put her on the spot, Anna. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, we're, we've got an extra half hour for lunch, and we, oh, we've question again, sorry. I, I, it's, I just, it's Peter, just, is it? No, Mikael. Oh, Mikael. I just oh, sorry. Have, sorry, sorry for asking so many questions, I, but I, I just um, was thinking of something when you were talking about the ribs on, on those boats, and I, I was wondering if all of the, all of the fantastic log boats you have in Ireland, is there any evidence on any of them of, of painting uh, and decoration otherwise? I mean, maybe if we saw these boats originally, these ribs would have been painted some different color and it might have been part of some broader decoration or something like that. This would be like the First Nations. Yeah, beautiful, I mean, yeah. I they're in often, Alaska and BC, they're just or, or in amazing. California, they were often painted red, which we never would have known if, uh -huh. uh, if it wasn't for ethnographic records. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly from my studies, I've seen no evidence uh, for it. It doesn't mean that it, it didn't happen. Um, there is one of the boats, I think it was found in, I, I can't swear by it, but in the 1930s maybe, I, I think there was a boat that was found, and, I, and I, I, as I recall, it, I might have been Loch Carb as well, where there was the finder had speculated that there was the carvings in the bow, which is I-V-I-I, -I -I. Uh, you know, with the Roman numerals, yeah. but, that's pure speculation. It, it could have been, you know, insect activity and, you know, a wild, ima enthusiastic imagination. Um, but there's no drawings of it that survive. Um, Carl mentioned about, you know, fire and the boats are burning as well. We do have that activity. Um, now, that, you know, I, I know it's something that's used in terms of hardening the exterior of the hull and being able to, you know, um, you know, you maintain it's help maintain its sort of smoothness and its integrity, if you like, and even prevent it from insect sort of activity. But that's not on the inside of the hulls, and we, we, we do have incidences of boats being deliberately uh, being burnt, and even historical sort of accounts that have actually reflected the same. But it's not the same as being being painted. Yeah, no, no, no paint that I'm aware of. But like, if you look at the Must Farm lock boats from is it Petersburg or, or, or England anyway, you see these uh, intricate designs on the outside, the crisscross marks that are carved into the boat. You know, I'm sure we have them in Ireland. And the Loch Carr boats, most, most of them, we haven't excavated the outside of them mostly because we didn't want to uncover them because then you introduce oxygen and, and uh, microorganisms that could tr tr uh, eat away at them. But we've had little peaks, we found nothing, but if we get to lift some of the boats, you know, we would hope that maybe there might be some design or something on the outside. Thank you. Right. Um, we're after lunch. We're going to the Nilo factory. The canoe. Yeah, just yep. a quick. Yeah. S just to be in the same page. So we'll be having the bus. Will be waiting here for us at two p.m. Uh, so the meeting point would be probably outside. Okay. So maybe uh, to take here for ten two because we've loads of time. We've an extra yeah. hour. Maybe okay. Be back here for ten two. Yeah. Two. Ten minutes. Yeah. Yes. Earlier. And we also have your certificates ready.
if you want, uh, in the desk, um, in the reception, if you want to take them with you now, or maybe tomorrow, it's okay. Yes? So. Great. So back at attention. Excuse me, just before we finish up, I think we still have time. I've just seen that there's an email for, um, from Elena Sarkon uh, in terms of some questions she has for the, for the session this morning, if I can okay. you know, read them out, if that's okay. Um, she says, okay, incredible presentations. Uh, for Carl, have you considered that the log boats, especially those uh, with other artifacts like axes or the one with big stone, might just be hidden and for some reason not found again by their owners? Mm. Uh, we have descriptions in South America of the practice of hiding dugout canoes underwater using stones to keep them in the bottom of the lakes or rivers to keep them from being stolen from enemies or just to prevent them from cracking or laying out in the sun. Just a thought. Uh, Elaine, yeah, it's, it's a, a good question and it is something we considered, but all the boats we've looked at are in five or six metres of water and we know that the lake was originally a metre higher until it was drained in, in the 1840s, so they're in seven metres of water and they're all hundreds, hundreds of metres from the shore, so I, I just think it would be too difficult for people at the time in the Bronze Age or Iron Age to, to locate the boats for a start, but also then to go down you know, you need diving equipment, um, unless the lake levels were lower, and we, we have no evidence for that. We have looked into it, we have no evidence. So um, I, I think they are accidental losses or uh, uh, depositions for a reason, but, you know, maybe not to hide them. The problem with La Carbe is that um, the, the, the lake goes up and down a lot by a couple of metres between summer and winter. So the lakes that would, maybe would have been hidden in the shallow waters you know, that, that were left there and never retrieved, they've probably all rotted away because they'd be exposed over every summer for over thousands of years. So uh, we probably don't have those type of boats surviving in, in, in the record. Okay, thank you, Carl. And thank you, Elena. And she has um, one comment. I think it's addressed to myself, perhaps. Another comment about the issue you mentioned with respect to the need of standardizing the recording of these types of material culture. I totally agree. You should not only think of doing it for Europe, it would be great to collaborate from this side of the Atlantic. Not many people are working on this topic around here. I think we should follow Mirren's lead and have a worldwide attempt. Very interesting, interesting presentations uh, for all, and I wish I could be there. And Elena, um, I absolutely agree with you in terms of, uh, of what you're saying there, and uh, Mirren was a very, very strong advocate of free access to information and sharing it as much as possible. Uh, I suppose as the title of my presentation, you know, you know, that, that, that the, we, we all rise together with the one tide if we, if we, if we share, and I, I, I think it'd be absolutely phenomenal. Um, he did start with, with Lars Kruger, um, you know, a, an online database uh, under GI systems, but I think it was for lack of funding and maintaining that website, I believe that it, it, it fell by the way, wayside. But it's certainly something that could be um, used as a vehicle to be able to create that sort of global information database as well, you know, for us as members and ambassadors of the early watercraft. So perhaps it's something that we should be looking at again in the future. Like Cyril mentioned uh, yesterday, obviously uh, with, with, with Mirren's passing, you know, to see where we go in, in terms of um, Mirren's ambitions with early watercraft global network and how we can you know, uh, process that in, you know, in honour of him and for our you know, mutual collective benefit as well. Okay, so, um, 1400 or 10 to 2 for the bus to the factory and then back here for 1630 or half four for the, the final session. So I think that's a wrap. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>